Any woodworker, new or old, is gonna make mistakes in the wood shop. I make mistakes every single day that I'm in here, but since I've been doing this so long, I've developed a bunch of techniques to cover those up. From the milling phase all the way through to the installation, I've got some tips and tricks that I'd like to share with you to help you cover up your mistakes. When it comes to fixing dents and dings, a lot of us reach to wood filler. I use wood filler all the time, but you have to be careful with it. I have two brands that I like. I like the Elmer's and the Timbermate. I've kind of been gravitating towards the Timbermate more now because I found out that you can re-wet it and kind of get the consistency that you want. But one thing that I see people doing wrong with wood filler is that they will just press it into the pores of the wood, covering up, uh, like especially open poured woods, things like oak or walnut, you'll actually fill in the wood grain and you'll see this little like haloed patch. I'm using the wrong color so that you can see what happens when you rub it in. I see a lot of people do it like this and they walk away and they're like, oh, that's great. Generally, I like to mask open poured woods with blue tape and apply the wood filler over the top. Fill it in like this. Be as aggressive as you want. That way you can like really push it into the, into the hole. Then you remove this, like so. You see, you've just filled that spot and you haven't filled all the wood grain. So if we were to sand this, you know, and this was like a color matched thing, you may not notice, but you've got wood filler in those pores, as opposed to this one, no extra wood filler. And that's a much cleaner Look, you may look at this without finish on it and be like, oh, this looks fine, this looks great. But the instant you start putting finish on it, it's gonna completely change. So if I get a little bit of water, you can see that looks nice and clean. Could just be a little knot hole. Over here, look at how much that wakes up. And now you can see all those little spots that you filled in. One thing to keep in mind when you're picking out wood fillers is the color. So a lot of wood actually changes color over time if it's exposed to UV. Most wood actually goes darker. Woods like walnuts go lighter when they uh, get exposed to the sun. So when you're picking the color, you should keep that in mind. Do a little bit of research because it's gonna stick out like a sore thumb when it eventually no longer matches. I've got a piece of furniture upstairs that was made out of red oak and I used a maple fill in it and it looked great when it was brand new and now you can see every single fill mark. So just be cautious when you pick them. Usually I err on the side of going darker than lighter because lighter calls more attention to itself. One thing I should also mention is wood glue and sawdust. That's a pretty common one. If you want to mix your own wood filler, that totally works. And I've used it a lot on my pattern plywood to fill in gaps and, and match colors that are harder to match. The only thing with that is you should be careful if you do it in a larger section, it can kind of mess with the sheen of your finish. So a lot of times when you're cutting, especially I do a lot of veneered plywood work and the veneer will lift and I like to keep CA glue close by. CA glue is kind of the multi-tool of the shop. I use it all the time for all sorts of little flaws. If a corner chips out, I, I grab this. Now it comes with an activator. An activator will accelerate the gluing process. So within like less than a minute, you can have the chip out or whatever you're trying to fix secured. Now I usually use a metal putty knife or a metal blade because the metal doesn't stick as opposed to your finger, you know, CA glue bonds really quickly to, to skin. So I use these to secure the workpiece while I'm working on it. Then I will spray the activator. I don't like to spray the activator beforehand because uh, you can't go back after you've sprayed it. And I found that Wood is porous enough that it'll absorb the activator in through the pores, and so you just spray it on top and it'll dry really quick. I usually go for the medium CA glue. I find that it's kind of the right viscosity. The thin stuff tends to run everywhere and get really messy, but this, this has worked really well for me. So I feel like every time I'm about to finish a piece of furniture and I'm sanding, I'll notice like a dent or a ding. A lot of times this comes from having, you know, some wood glue on your table and you lay it on there and it just presses a little dent into the side of the furniture. Don't worry, it's not ruined. <laughs> there is a really easy way to fix that. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this technique before, but it absolutely blew my mind when I first discovered it. I thought I'd ruined a piece of furniture and a friend of mine came by and he, and he was just like, you can steam out dents. 
All right, those are pretty extreme. I don't know, if you, if you end up breaking the fibers, you can't quite do it, but I think most of these will actually come out. We'll find out. Using a regular clothing iron, you lay a wet cloth on top of the wood and you can just apply heat and it will steam it out. Oh man, it's almost gone. That's definitely sand outable at this point. I think I can get it even better. All right, I think that's what we're gonna get. That's pretty darn good. Just the tiny bit where we tore the grain. But a little bit of sanding and that would be gone too. I mean, you can only feel a tiny bit right here. There you go, they're gone. I've actually found over the years that I'll get lazy and I'll just use a wet cloth with some warm water from the tap and that works pretty well too. So if you have a board that has a flaw in it that you can't live with, <laughs> there are a few different ways to deal with it. One of them is to fill it. Obviously you could fill this with epoxy. If you saw my elevator table video, I did this. I uh, dyed epoxy with black to fill in one knot that was on the table surface. It turned out great. I just used some graphite powder mixed with some epoxy and you would never know. It just looks like a knot. The other option, if you want the knot to disappear completely, is something called a Dutchman. If you think about the story of the kid that stuck his finger in the dike, that's, I think, where the term Dutchman comes from. It's a patch that fills a hole. It's a really handy thing to know how to do. It, you may not get a perfect grain match, but it's a, it's a way to just kind of cover up an issue. So it's always easier to match the hole to the patch than it is to match a patch to a hole. It's really hard if there's any sort of um, discrepancies in the in the shape of it or uh, to, to try and match a you know chunk of wood to fit in there perfectly. It can be done but it's going to be a lot more time consuming. To make a Dutchman I usually cut the piece of wood that I think matches the area that I'm trying to cover up get the closest grain match as possible, and then I will lay that on top of the workpiece covering up the section that I want to patch. I can then trace it around the Dutchman with a knife and remove the part so I can hog out material. You can use a Forstner bit for this. I like to use both a Forstner bit and a router. I'll freehand route it up to the line and then I'll clean that up with a chisel and work my way up to a nice tight fit. Then it's just a matter of adding some wood glue, inserting the Dutchman, letting it dry, and removing any excess material on the top. It's always good to have a little bit of excess on top so that you can sand it down flush. Oh, that is smooth. That's pretty smooth. That's how you make a Dutchman. So I was at a conference last weekend, and bear with me for a second, but this conference is called Workbench Con, and you may have heard of it, it's a bunch of YouTube makers like me that make content and it's kind of the best time for us to talk shop, talk collaborations, uh, get to know new makers in the community. And I kept getting the same comment over and over again because I was wearing all of my merch as a lot of us do. And people were just like, that's really nice quality. And like, where did you get it? And like, who's making it? And I'm like, I, I know I've been working really hard to source these things and I feel like I've never really talked about it. So uh, this is an unsponsored video. I just wanted to shout out my own website, not because I'm so great, but because the people that I work with are amazing and I've very carefully selected the people that make my merch. I decided a little while ago that I only wanted to support small businesses when we produce uh, um, items for the website. So the hats are made by Ink and Emblem out of Boise, Idaho. They are awesome. Kyle is a fan of the channel and he worked really hard with me to get these things perfect. The patches, uh, we, we now have the patches on their own and look at how nice these are. We worked probably harder than we should have to get these perfect and in my opinion, they are absolutely perfect and beautiful. So now you can buy those on the website. We've got black hats for the first time in the dragon scale pattern. And we also have the emerald is back in stock. It's been out of stock for six months. Another small business that I work with is Foundation Press. They do all of the t-shirts and sweatshirts. They're out of California and they're artists and I love working with them. We also just brought on tools to the website. So my buddy Jonathan Katz Moses, he is a good buddy of mine and he has been supporting the channel for a little while. I really have enjoyed collaborating with him and he has so many good tools on his website that I reached out and I was like, hey, 
would you be interested in putting some of those on Almfab so I can support your small business with my small business? You can see where I'm going here. So we have some handpicked by me, Jonathan Katz Moses KM Tools tools on the website now, and we're gonna be adding more and more, and Jonathan and I are working on some stuff behind the scenes, which I'm really excited about, but not quite ready to share. We also have plans, which I have my, my good friend Brett, who helps me build the plans. He's an actual engineer, so he is way over qualified to build the plans on the website and they are awesome. Hopefully if you've bought a set of plans, you know how good they are. We pride ourselves on making the best possible plans. I have an artist brain, Brett has an engineer brain and we collaborate and I make it easy to understand and he makes it comprehensive and accurate. So anyway, shout out to the HomeFab website. Go on there, it really helps support me and a lot of other small businesses. If you have a corner of a board with some massive tear out or something that you can't fix with CA glue or another technique, one thing to keep in mind is that you can actually remove material, make it flat so that there's enough glue surface, glue another board that kind of matches on there and then sand it back flush. This is maybe obvious to some, but I definitely have had some moments where I'm like, uh, how am I gonna repair this? And realizing that actually removing material is gonna make it easier to fix than just trying to repair this small section that's there. So I haven't heard many people talk about this, but when you install a piece of furniture and you're at a client's house or your own house and you don't have a whole wood shop with you, how you fix issues and they always come up something gets dented or dinged so i always keep wax pencils with me when i go to a job site this is kind of an old world technique i feel like old woodworkers knew this but but new woodworkers i haven't seen anybody mention this this is a uh, putty stick old masters makes this i'll link everything down below but uh it's it's just wax but it's colored wax that is designed to match different wood types. So I have it in black, brown, all sorts of different browns. The nice thing about this is that it will fill holes, but also it's wax. So you can buff it and it'll match the sheen of your finish. And then another really weird one for fixing things on job sites is actually bringing some walnuts with you. Walnuts have oil in them and uh, they can actually darken wood. I'm not really sure the, the chemistry of it, but what you do is you take a walnut and you crack it in half and then you rub it on the scratch and it virtually disappears. Now it's not a wood filler, but it will disguise anything that's like super bright compared to the finish. And so if you've got an old piece of furniture with a couple scratches on it, walnuts are really handy to have. Um, the other thing is a Sharpie. If you have a black finish, if there's some sort of ding where you see through, like you'll blacken maple with, with black ink. And then if it has some sort of flaw on it, you can use a Sharpie, but just make sure that when you apply it, that you also uh, rub the excess away because it can kind of look purplish if you're not careful. Now, if you drill a hole in the wrong spot, which happens to me fairly often, you just have to adjust it slightly. You may have found that if you try to re-drill it slightly above, the drill bit wants to sink into the hole that you drilled previous. It goes to the path of least resistance. So you want to fill that hole. Now, if it's a quarter inch, you can always use a dowel. And uh, I've done this many times to just plug it and re-drill it. But if it's smaller than that, and most screw holes are, I like to keep toothpicks and skewers around and you can stab these into the hole. They actually have a point on them so you can kind of hammer them in. Add a little bit of CA glue, spray the accelerator on top of that. So once you get it filled in and you've given the CA glue enough time to dry, you can go ahead and drill almost anywhere. You can even drill kind of halfway into that piece and it's gonna drill straight down. One thing that happened to me recently on the fridge surround is that the big panels, the grain matched panels that went floor to ceiling started to cup on me. The problem was that I installed them without finish on them, did a dry fit and in the house, the heat was on. And so the outside was drying and the inside was maintaining the same level of moisture. So it sort of cupped outward. If you think about like a sponge, if you wet the surface of the sponge, 
it's going to expand and the other side will stay the same size. So it's gonna actually go con convex on the side that gets wet. Same thing happens with wood. If you think about it, when the wood doesn't have any sort of finish on it, it can absorb moisture from the air. And so when it gets wet on the outside face, it's going to cup outward. All right, so about an hour ago, we put water on this board to just illustrate like how much it will cup if the, if the moisture is unevenly distributed. Now this started out as a perfectly flat panel, but now it's got a pretty decent cup in it. This is obviously a pretty extreme situation, but what you can do is wet the opposing side. So this is why you wet the side that's concave, not convex, and that should pull the panel back to flat. Then you let it dry gradually. Then you wanna apply finish and it'll be a stable panel. So let it dry for a couple hours and now you can see it's almost perfectly flat. So you're able to, it's still a little bit damp on one side. I think as soon as it dries out, it's gonna be, yeah, it's pretty dead on, honestly. Now here's a bonus trick that kind of comes up less frequently, but it did actually happen really recently on the, on the fridge surround build. I found that I had a, a crack between two panels. When I installed it, I screwed it to the wall and it pulled the two panels apart. All the finish was on it, it was basically done, but there was this little black crack between the two joints and it stood out like a sore thumb. So I like to reach for veneer when that happens. Fortunately, I had a piece of oak veneer that matched and I slotted that in with a little bit of wood glue and then trimmed it flush and now you can't see that crack at all. So maybe that'll help you, maybe it'll come in handy at some point. So hopefully you found a few tips or tricks that you can use in your own shop. If you have any mistakes or flaws or issues that you've had in the past in the wood shop, let me know in the comments down below because maybe we can do a follow-up video to this in the future. Big thank you as always to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you on the next one.